came and seeks us. He came to save us. He came to raise us from the dead. Know that in Jesus Christ you are forgiven, and be at peace. May the peace of Christ be with each of you. Let us greet one another. Pray for music and musicians, and we pray for joy. 
We pray for kindness that makes peace. For these things we pray, now and always. Amen. Thanks, guys. Before you leave, tell me, how was Halloween? Awesome! Lots of candy! Big candy bars. I got candy bars, too. Kit Kats. Did you get any of those? They were chocolate. They were little things. Awesome. You need a friend to share, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> How was Halloween, man? Yeah. Was it good? Was it fun? Did you see any did you see any skeletons that made you scary? Yeah. Yeah, some scary masks that made you scary. What did you dress up as? Batman. <gasps> Batman saves the day! Always! He scares the scary away. <laughs> Love Batman. Okay. Well, he refused to cross him. But we tried to cross it. Oh, I saw two pumpkins today in the river. But I was in an island or something. Or maybe a place. I didn't see it. You're listening. I saw two pumpkins in the river today. When I was walking behind the city one. How come people do you think might throw pumpkins in the river? Why wouldn't they just leave them out of the water so the deer can eat them? Or the mice or the squirrels or something to eat them? Fish? Pumpkins? I don't think. I don't think he's fishy pumpkins. But that's another thing. When people throw things where they don't belong, that's not these nice shots. <laughs> nice shots. <laughs> All right, time to get this show on the road. Or at least try. <laughs> try, try, try. Let's just get my little message here. Please join me in prayer for illumination. Let us pray.
I love that spiritual. Thank you. Seems to me that sometimes in life we have all the time in the world, and other times in life we can't hurry home fast enough. I don't know where any of you are today, but I invite you to find rest and peace in the word of the Lord. Our second lesson comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 27 through 38. Listen once again for the word of the Lord. Some Sadducees, those particularly who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up the children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman and died childless, then the second, and the third married her. And so, in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being themselves children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now God is God not of the dead, but of the living. For to God all of them are alive. The word of the Lord. The hardest sentence now, he is God, not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. I don't know if the verses catch you like they catch me, but when I first read that last week, I was like, God, it's easy for you to see us all alive, because you knew us before we were formed in our mother's wombs, you knew us from our first morning cry, you watch us our whole lives, you steady us through our deaths, Jesus comes and, and leaves with us safely to home. But to us, we're not all alive. We grieve, we worry, and we wonder. Today of all days, I'm sad about this text. But you know, I know you've heard of the three main groups of Jewish people in Jesus' times. The Sadducees, right? You've heard of them. They were kind of the privileged class of Jesus' day, educated, but they were also pretending to be uh, the privileged ones who collaborated with the Romans. And among them, there were people who believed in the resurrection, but there were people who didn't. And these particular people didn't, and they were trying to trip Jesus up. It seems like we approach Jesus looking for answers, just like the Sadducees. And sometimes maybe our, we want to believe, we want to yield, we want to bend, and we want to understand, and it's hard sometimes to take his word for it. Because what Jesus says to us just doesn't compute. It's like that thing I said in the very beginning. Trust me. And God bless us, we try. We justly, justly try. But let's go back to the Sadducees for a minute. The elites of the community are looking to slap down Jesus. They rightly perceive that he's about changing the social order. And like many Pharisees, try to give him a puzzle that they can't believe can be solved. Though I am a Christian pastor, I think for myself, this is one of those places, Lord, where nothing is too hard for God, but Lord, this is too hard for me to preach. So if you're going to say something, nothing is too hard for you, you better show up today, just like Jeremiah 32, 17 says. You just better. 
But Jesus, being Jesus, proves himself an able thinker, an able problem solver, and an able storyteller. And he at least gets himself out of the jam. Now, I think we already have lots in common with these guys, because there's lots of problems that we think are too big to be solved too, right? Homelessness, cancer, war, inflation, racism, sexism, and every other ism of which you can think. And even though we have Jesus' person and teachings, most of the time we are anxious because we still find ourselves living in the confluence of lots of jams, and we only have a little bit of light in Scripture. And I would contend that even though we only have a little bit of light in Scripture, we have a lot of light in the Holy Spirit, we have a lot of light in each other, and we only need a light just to our feet, just for the next step. We don't need any more light than that, because if we had more light than that, like those Halloween costumes, we might be too scared to go. Now, I know that most people, um, I myself sometimes struggle with the finer details of elaborate law. If a brother dies and he has a brother, the brother, the surviving brother is supposed to marry a widow. I've never been a brother. Does that sound like a good idea to you? Does it sound <laughs> sounds like a whole screwed up family dynamic, doesn't it? Man, we people get in trouble with that unless they well, never mind. But the ethics of Leverett Law was actually an important idea. That whole marrying your brother's widow thing was to protect family property and the line of inheritance. It was also supposed to continue the person in the community's memory. Oh, that's that's Jerry's children or whatever. But it was also supposed to be a social safety net for women and children. So that just is a measure of how far away these stories are from us. We wouldn't go about it that way. Therefore, people can write it off, but the intention is a holy intention. Now, I'm surprised that the Sadducees, being who they were, weren't interested, were, were couching the question about the wife. Who cares about the wife? She died too, right? I had to take, the, I had to stand back and say, were they honestly asking this question when they really probably cared about all the financial pieces more? So there's the ethics of the Leverett Law that's supposed to take care of people, protect family properties, inherit, uh, continue the person's memory and the community, have a social safety net for women and children, but there's also another way, another way of managing problems. And and this is a really weird way for a modern mind or postmodern mind to think about. In the biblical world, there was actually a time when problems could be forgiven by just taking a break. It's called the Jubilee year. Violence was averted. Land can't be worn out. Land is given a break. It can't be sold in perpetuity. It might be leased, but not in the Jubilee year. Crops might be sold, but not in the Jubilee year. And in the Jubilee year, that land goes back to the original the tribe, even if the original member passed away, the original family passed away. That is a weird way of doing things, isn't it? But don't we value people who can think outside the box and solve problems in ways that seem weird? If we can value the creativity instead of judge it, maybe it will give us a little light to walk by. Now the Sadducees are asking Jesus about whose wife she will be in the kingdom of heaven. I heard a theology professor in seminary say that's like trying to figure out how many angels can dance on a pinhead. And he's right. If there is no wife, there is no husband, and there is no heir to an estate, the old family line is broken, the tendency was broken, probably is and was the only mechanism for the transfer of land and the transfer of communal resources. That's a problem because that's, there, there's, no, there's no way to move the property along because the property didn't belong to the family or the tribe, it only belonged to God. It took me a long time to make the connection, and it may be a tenuous connection, but all the people, husbands and wives, Sadducees and Pharisees and Essenes and Jesus, all the people belong to God too. And all the land, if somebody dies and there's nobody to pass it along to, all the land go back, goes back to God, reverts to God, because God is the landlord. Israel and everybody else are just tenants. But Israel was the manager, the property manager of the land release. These 
Sadducees actually do us a favor. They point us to the very things we don't know but want to know and are afraid to directly ask. Jesus is basically saying everybody reverts back to God, everybody reverts back to God's self, and everybody goes back to God's, God's creative imagin and sustaining imagination. Now, I know in church on Sundays, most Sundays, at least since I've been here, we affirm the resurrection each week in a creed. Without that in mind, most of the time, we just say it by rote. We don't necessarily think about it. If we do think about it, sometimes we mutter or roll our eyes, but we still get through it. We keep on going. Sometimes we think about it, though. Underneath our routine confessions of faith, questions about nature and form and importance of the re resurrection might be roiling. Several people around here have told me, I don't believe in the resurrection. That's just, that's just fairy tales. And I thought about it. I'm like, it might be, but would it change who you are and what you do on a daily basis? Because that's the underlying important question. If it's all about pie in the sky when we die, maybe we miss part of the equation. The passage pointed for this Sunday is just peculiar enough that it might bring some more of those questions to the surface. And I don't know how to preach a, a skinny body of gospel. I don't know how to preach a full body of gospel. But here's my hope. The very fact that it's peculiar assumes two bits of biblical knowledge about the Sadducees and what Leverett marriage is, and I've already explained those things. So here I'm going to move to the questions that it spikes for me. Mike spikes for you. He's very explicit in explaining what the resurrection will be like, but it's not very satisfying. It's not very satisfying because I don't have any direct experience with it. I can't explain it to you any better than what he explained it to me here. What will the resurrection life be like? It's an important, understandable question that because we're all naturally curious about what comes next, both for our loved ones and for ourselves. The passage doesn't give us very much detail. It revolves, after all, a hypothetical question that the Sadducees asked Jesus in order to discredit him while simultaneously trying to embarrass the resurrection of the rivals, the Pharisees. It's always about competition with us. Don't you just wish they would have asked him, what's it going to be like when you die? Because we would have. Right? We're not shy. We would have. But even if the passage doesn't paint a vivid picture, it does insist that resurrection life is qualitatively different from life as we know it now. That's why we grieve. Intuitively, we understand it's going to be different. How could it not be? Right? I was having lunch with a pastor and we were talking about how we're, somehow we got in this discussion of organ donation, right? And we were talking about how the Catholic Church has changed its teaching over the decades about organ donation. It used to be a flat no, right? Because it interfered with God's providence or something like that, which made me laugh because it sounded Presbyterian, but it wasn't. And my take on the whole thing was God gave us organs the first time. If we need them in heaven, don't you think we'll give them to us the second time? <laughs> See, I don't fit in often. Everybody laughed at me, but I was really serious. The resurrection life is qualitatively different from life as we know it. This is, in fact, a mistake Jesus points out the Sadducees, Sadducees are making. Their question is premised on the assumption that eternal life is an endless state of more of the same. That sounds like bad news to me. The resurrection life, Jesus insists, is different. The ordinary events and relationships by which we track our journey through this mortal life, marriage, childbirth, graduations, retirements, and so on, do not characterize our eternal lives because resurrection life is not merely an extension of this one, but something wholesale different. That has to be good news. I think. No radio stations, no newspapers, no TV sharing bad news. That's just the tiniest little different thing I can imagine. What would you imagine to put to the list? The second question is, is Jesus saying we won't know our spouses, our friends, and our family members? I think that's an understandable next question. I thought about it myself. I've discussed it with other people several times. 
Jesus' words about not marrying and our previous emphasis on the qualitative difference of the resurrection life, this is, it may be asked, spoken or silently, consciously or unconsciously, with some feeling or some trepidation, as most of us have a hard time imagining eternity without our loved ones. Again, grief. Who wants to be without the people that we love? But let me ask you something. And please don't move, shake your head, raise your hand, or do anything that I sometimes ask you to do. Human life is hard. And sometimes we love each other with all our hearts, but we still need a break. Sometimes absence really does make the heart grow fonder. Because we forget all the things that irritate the bejeebers out of us, right? As important as that question is, Jesus isn't addressing it here. He does not say we will not know those who have been dear to us, only that the resurrection life will not be marked by the same features as this one. Indeed, given his next statement about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it seems that the relationships defining our current life may persist, certainly with God and likely with each other. The third question that I thought of and I think other people think of is resurrection the same thing as immortality? In actuality, very few of my thoughts, my family, my friends, and maybe hearers like you can articulate this question explicitly. But we can, nevertheless, count on the fact that many of us regularly confuse immortality and resurrection. Why? Because the immortality of the soul, the belief that some essential or spiritual element of a person persists beyond the physical death of the body, provides a measure of comfort to those grieving loss assuring them that at least part of their beloved has not, in fact, died. Nothing can be gained or lost in this system. It just changes, Jesus says. In distinction to this notion, Christians have instead confessed that while we really and truly do die, resurrection promises that the whole person will, in some way, be united with God. And here is the real problem as I perceive it sometimes. As majestic as that sounds, it doesn't sound possible, and it doesn't sound fun. And I wonder where we get that from. Because my God is the God of dancing dogmas, the chirping birds, the toppling toddlers, the beloveds. Is union with God sufficient for us? Or are we still grasping for something else? Even though I think the distinction between immortality and resurrection matters, you might not. And I don't want to belabor the point or seem to scold anybody for not being clear about the words or some theological statement about piety. I just hope that we can rest in the resurrection in a way that offers us some kind of full-throated, full-bodied, full-hearted, full-minded <coughs> hope in the gospel. After teaching some adults in a study about the resurrection some years ago, a prisoner came was very upset. Her husband had died the previous year and her belief in the immortality of the soul had brought comfort to her. I don't know if it was a mistake or not, but as gently as I could, I said that I didn't want to take that comfort away, but rather to make it stronger, maybe more complete. What I want and hope for you is more than the wispy essence of your husband. I want the whole person for you, the whole person created, loved, and now redeemed by God in and through Christ. We cried. Over time, it seemed like that affirmation helped reckon, helped her reckon with her grief, not by denying it, but by promising that there would be an end to it. For everything, there is a time and a season. And indeed, an end to all our grief, all our tears, all our suffering, when God creates a new heaven and a new earth and invites us all to live there together with God and in the fellowship of the saints. 
these things are hard and they're important. But I hope when we speak to our loved ones, our families, our friends, our, our, our church mates, I just hope that we will have the courage to talk about our beliefs and our affirmations and, and, and be like the Hebrew. Western languages, romance languages, English, we try really hard in our litigious society. We try to nail words together and nail them to the floor such that any change in interpretation can be avoided. But the Hebrews, they left spaces between their words that were so big you could drive a Mack truck through them. And when we're being together as people of God together, can we just leave space so that we can all get through this thing called life with the hope that someday we'll be together and not only that we will be together, but that we will be united together and united to God. Because that's the beautiful thing. Our hope is about. It's the beautiful thing that our hope that we are meant to share about our hope. It's the beautiful thing among our community that makes us different than every place else. Not so that we can be proud, but so that we can be at peace. Here ends the reading of the word of the Lord. Our hymn is number 633.
much to pray for. We continue in prayers for Ukraine. We continue in prayers for those who have no work, for those who have no home, and for those who have no hope. We pray for those near and dear to us, those we have lost, we trust that God finds. We pray for those who are not at peace, for whatever reason. And we pray with the whole church who Jesus taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and we forgive our debtors. And there is not a temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and glory forever. Amen. Friends, everything that we have, and everything that we are, already belongs to the Lord. We have freely received from God's goodness. Let us return to God the offerings of our life, and the gifts of the earth. And I warn the people who are going to pick up these plates, they're heavy today because of the points.
who sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord God, we thank you for coming to be one of us, for your life, for your ministry, for your death, for your resurrection, and for promising to come again in power. We give you thanks for the gift of the sacrament. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took the bread and gave thanks to you. But who could tie the night of him and let him on? He took the bread and after giving thanks to you, he broke it. He gave it to his friends, to his disciples. He said, take and eat this bread. This is my body given for you. Do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink this cup, remember me. Thank you, God, for these gifts. And thank you for the greatness of the mystery that is you. And thank you for the greatness of the mystery that is our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will live again. Amen. According to Christ's commandment, we remember his death and proclaim his resurrection, and we await his coming in glory. Holy God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts. That the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion body and blood of Christ. Thank you, Holy One. Thank you, Holy Three. All this we pray through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, by the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor are yours, Almighty One, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, if you have your small cups, open the wafer side. This is the body of Christ. In the same way, turn it over. Open the juice side. This is the cup of the new covenant, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. No choking loud, but our closing hymn is number 494. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 5.
Stand by the weak. Support the suffering. Now, may the grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the companionship of Jesus be with you one and all, now and forever. Amen.